All right. Welcome back, Professor Farrell. Good to be with you both. We're very happy to have you again. So since uh, our last discussion was very fruitful uh, and things have developed quite a bit since we discussed uh, your article on whether there is a moral obligation to be vaccinated, we uh, are very happy to have you back for a kind of follow-up discussion. Um, so this time uh, we thought of trying to go beyond uh, what uh, you discuss in your article, which was not necessarily addressing what we're seeing now, although it did foreshadow it um, with uh, with vaccine passports and, and the moral issues that that raises. Um, so we uh, we are hoping to start off first um, with a disclaimer uh, to uh, kick off the discussion. Then we want to set some uh, sort of assumptions up uh, and make sure we're all on the same page with those. And uh, we can go into some more moral discussions uh, that came up with the latest developments uh, that are coming up, at least in Canada, but definitely in the rest of the world. That sounds fair. I will begin. So like last time, we uh, obviously neither of us are uh, medical experts. Professor Farrow is a professor of uh, religion and ethics at McGill University. Perry and I are uh, technical people. We both have degrees in, in science. Uh, and um, although we find morality and, and, and these other topics very interesting, uh, and mo more importantly, we want to explore the intersection between technical disciplines and, and, and scientific and empirical uh, disciplines with, with the moral and, and the spiritual. Um, so uh, with that, um, anything that we present is always going to be personal opinion. Uh, people can always go out and check out their own facts and make up their own minds about medical decisions or, or any other kind of thing. Um, we just want to explore the topic as much as possible. Um, and from there, uh, we want to just set up some common ground uh, so that we don't have to, uh, to think about it much more after. Um, but we're talking about COVID-19, which uh, we can all agree is a contagious pathogen that uh, harms or may harm in some case, may or may not harm the body uh, of people. Um, and the, you know, it, it's not just uniformly harming everyone, but it's quite well established that this is a pathogen that disproportionately harms people that have either severe uh, uh, comorbidities or are uh, advanced in age. Um, so, uh, what else is there? So also, you know, this is, uh, we can, we can probably agree that this is also a, something of a black swan or an anomaly in that it is a stronger disease than what we are typically used to dealing with, at least in terms of contagious, uh, sort of pandemic, uh, situations. Um, however, you know, natural immunity does provide a strong, uh, a strong, robust defense. So a lot of people uh, are going to be entirely unaffected by this. Um, and it's something that we, uh, you know, as the, as the pandemic has developed, ha there have been many treatments that are developed. And the most discussed uh, lately are the uh, vaccinations, which are meant to prevent infection, uh, symptomatic development, and transmission of the disease. Um, in, in some cases, especially in those of uh, more people that are more at risk, this type of uh, preventive measure is more uh, beneficial uh, and more severely outweighs the risks of taking uh, any kind of medical intervention, especially newly developed uh, vaccine technologies. Um, and I believe those are all the facts on the ground that I have. Uh, if anyone has any objections or anything to add, please let me know. Sound fair? All right. So uh, now we can get into the real discussion. Uh, and uh, I think we wanted to start with something very basic since um, you think a lot about morality and, and ethics. Um, we were wanting to start with the question of why is this a moral debate to begin with? So, uh, you know, lately there's been a lot of um, treatment of, of actions that people take under the pandemic as some kind of moral imperative. You know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be putting others in harm's way or, or you, shouldn't be, uh, you shouldn't be foregoing any preventive measures that you could have uh, undertaken. Um, whereas, uh, you know, one could think that uh, we've, before this pandemic, we've already faced a lot of transmission uh, sort of contagious pathogens that we haven't associated so much moral burden or, or so much um, you know so much of a 
yeah, so much of a moral burden to the way people behave under these circumstances. So, you know, uh, if if you catch a cold, you don't you don't go around wondering who gave it to you and whether they could have uh, maybe stayed home or worn a mask that day. I mean, obviously, if someone shows up to your office and they're blowing their nose every two seconds and coughing everywhere, you might get a bit upset. But I think the degree of uh, sort of yeah, how, the way this is treated in terms of moral imperatives has definitely been heightened. And I'm wondering if you think this is productive or counterproductive for the health of our society. Uh, I, I think it's I think it's counterproductive. Um, you know, I I sympathize with um, with the person who doesn't want to catch cold. I've I've frequently you know had just that kind of feeling, like you know you know go and open the window so that you're less likely to you know to spend a, a week being miserable. Uh, so I, I understand that entirely, and there's nothing new about that. Um, on the other hand, as I believe we said last time, uh, there's something very new about the degree to which we seem presently willing to go in pursuit of safety, um, even though, as you said a moment ago, most people are not going to suffer more serious consequences from COVID than, than they do from a bad flu. Um, it, we, we somehow have gone a, a great deal further in our pursuit of safety. And, and that suggests to me that this fixation on safety that we have uh, is, is linked to other things that are going on in our culture and in our collective psyche. Um, and the, the simplest way in which I would say that the result is harmful, never mind the, the, the exact cause, that the result is harmful is easily shown from, from the um, serious negative effects on, on um, people that, through the lockdowns. You know, the, 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 there's a lot of suffering there's a lot of damage being done uh, by those lockdowns. Um, at the moment, we're not mostly locked down, but there are countries in the world that are. Um, and so uh, the, the harm that it does, like, I mean, if, I, if someone comes into my, in my office and they've got a bad cold and I seem a little cold towards them <laughs> for selfish reasons, um, that may do a little bit of harm. Professor wasn't very friendly today. <laughs> um, um, you know, he didn't want to shake my hand or whatever, you know. Um, but it's another thing to do the kind of harms that 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 e even the even the governments are admitting we have done with these lock some, you know, admitting to some extent that we have done with these lockdowns. So the, the pursuit of safety. Um, if carried to an extreme, um, is is indeed capable of causing harm, and I think I think the fact that we're so willing to cause harm through our 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 preferred safety mechanisms in this case, the lockdowns, um, and 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 the course of vaccine mandates, um, th this ought to yeah this ought to cause us to question ourselves. Do you think it's uh, maybe related somehow to a movement from from the sphere of responsibility between from going from individuals to some sort of collective, uh, you know, uh, effort? Like now, if you if you give COVID to someone else, like you said, most likely they're not going to end up in the hospital, and most likely the people that they infect aren't going to end up in the hospital. But it seems like now. Uh, people subscribe to the idea that we need to, as an entire population, achieve this aim, which is, you know, get rid of this pathogen altogether or rescue the hospitals or something like that. So it's no longer like you got me sick and I had a bad uh, time, you know, and I'm not going to get mad at anyone else. But now it's sort of like this higher level uh, moral sphere that's been introduced to what usually wasn't as much applied. Yeah, and I... 
I, I find it, um, I find it difficult to know just why it has been elevated to that level because it was it was always true that you know what to you as an innocent flu is fatal to somebody it, it, it's always always been true that um you know uh you could pass on at any time something that that you are infected with, perhaps unknowingly, um, uh, to someone whose system is not capable of handling it. And that's just in the sphere of infectious diseases, which we could discuss in, in terms of sexual behavior too. You know, what, you know, what degree of safety do people intend to go to in order to make sure that they don't hurt anybody? Um, we have seen, as you've said, a tremendous escalation in the last year and a half of this public safety concern. And it's been used as a, a justification for asking people to make extraordinary sacrifices. Where did that come from? We understand it in war. So if the country is at war, we ask our young people to take extraordinary risks to, to um, in service of the cause and the country. And of course, if we're thinking morally, we ask ourselves, you know, is this cause justified? Is, is the action we're taking justified? Was that real data that we got about, you know, nuclear weapons in, in Iraq <laughs> and so forth, right? Or, or were we being led down the garden path? We ask all those kinds of questions. We're used to doing that. Somehow in this last year and a half, things seem to have changed over one relatively minor threat, you know, a war against a coronavirus. Um, and we have no reason to think that wars against coronaviruses can actually be won. Um, lockdowns, whatever, you know, we have no evidence from the past that you can actually eradicate a coronavirus by taking such actions. And yet we've asked these kinds of, of sacrifices from people. So you're asking me, but I'm asking you, why have we done that? Yeah, so, I, well, I guess maybe to, uh, so maybe I'll answer your question that you're posing us with another question. Um, do you think uh, these sacrifices would be warranted? Or under what conditions do you think these sacrifices would be warranted? Like what, what would be the, um, what, 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 what would the coronavirus have to do to make this, these sacrifices warranted, I guess is the question. Would it have to be 50 times as deadly as the flu, a thousand times as deadly, uh, much more infectious? Um, is there a limit where you say th this is warranted and, uh, and, and, and we should lock down or we should? Uh... Well, yeah. So look, it's like any other area of life. Um, if you, you know, if you get a cut or a scrape and it doesn't look like it's getting infected, you don't do very much, right? You watch it, you watch it. If you have a reason to think it's getting infected, you do something more more demanding. You make an appointment with your doctor and you, and you, you know, think about antibiotics and so forth. Um, but, but in so, this case, it's my choice, right? I, I, I choose to get the antibiotics. I choose to look after my cut. And now with these coronavirus, these measures are enforced by some, uh, you know, leader, yeah. some elected leader, say. Yeah. So there are two things going on here. Let me, let me deal with them separately. Um, to finish the first thought, um, the more, the more, the, the higher the toll a pathogen takes on you and your neighbors and the, the citizenry generally, the more sacrifices and the more effort you're going to be prepared uh, to offer to mitigate uh, and to, and to uh, um, uh, try to resolve the situation as well as possible. So if you're dealing with the Spanish flu, 
uh, you know, as an illustration I think we used last time, you're going to work a lot harder than if you're dealing with SARS-CoV-2. Um, now, um, what should you do? Well, that's another matter, which I'll just briefly say, um, you want to do things that seem to work. Um, <laughs> you, you know, if, if, if you're going to do something as dramatic as locking people down for long periods of time, not quarantining those who are already sick until their 14 days has passed, but locking down societies, you want to be sure that works and that it does way more good than harm. Ditto for vaccines or any kind of medication you're giving. Um, uh, you want to make sure that it works. So part of the whole dispute here is have these things worked and are they working? That's a big part of the dispute. But to come to the other question, um, the, the, the question of, of um, which I took it was going in the direction of coercive mandates. Um, even before we go further into that, Let's just say that um, um, I think I think when we make the shift from uh, from you will decide or I will decide what actions to take, what what's pr good prudential judgment in the face of this threat, whatever level of severity the threat is, to someone else will take all those decisions. That raises questions about the nature of our polity and the role of the citizenry in collective decisions. Um, but it also raises another very interesting question, and that is, who gets to decide when a situation is serious enough to, to warrant um, short-circuiting some of those uh, public debates and simply giving, you know, ruling by fiat. In other words, who gets to decide what really is a state of exception or not a state of exception? Now, that's a fundamental question, political philosophy that Carl Schmidt brought very much to the fore. Um, but but I, I don't approach it as he does, but, uh, but I, I think it's a very important question because if, if someone can decide that this is an emergency and therefore emergency powers can be exercised and we don't have any real say in that, well, then it, it wouldn't, I mean, just looking at it um, logically uh, rather than with particular facts in view, it wouldn't even have to be a coronavirus that's worse than the ordinary flu, but a long way off the Spanish flu. <laughs> it, it, could be, it could be climate change. It could be something that's actually not very important at all. It, it could be, well, you know what? I really don't like catching cold from you. I'm sick and tired of it. I've had it with, with you giving me colds. So I'm calling this a state of emergency and under the state of emergency, thou shalt not enter my office. <laughs> all right, I will do all the deciding and you get no more say in this. <laughs> uh, it, uh, you see what I'm saying? I'm, I, I'm simply saying that the person who gets to decide what qualifies as an emergency and so declare emergency powers, as Schmidt pointed out, <laughs> is the person who truly wields authority in that society. I guess so, it's someone, yeah. sorry, that has to be trusted at the end of the day, because I would imagine that the alternative, which would be the government is some sort of recommendation engine that says, look, there's this pathogen, it's this deadly, everybody can decide what to do. Um, some You can maybe call it like a democratic approach, that might be untenable, right? Because then you would say, okay, well, 99% of people will be fine. Let's sacrifice the 1% and we're going to sort of live the way we want to live. So do you think that we, there's no way of getting around this idea of trusting someone to take this decision for us um, at some point, or, or can we say, let's leave it up to a democratic process? 
That's that's a good question and a difficult one. First of all, I don't I don't think the human being is the kind of creature that can live without trust. Um, and I do think that that um, proper um, juridical authority arises from um, from earned trust, where justice has been done and seen to be done, and and therefore um, the the um, responsible authorities are approved and 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 respected for what they have done. Now, of course, we're all we're all fallible. We're all fallen, as a theologian would say as well. So you know, there's there's no pursuit of perfection here, but there is a general confidence, um, and this is a good thing. The problem in the present circumstances, as I see it, is that is not that that the authorities have expected what is the ordinary level of trust, um, but that they have, um, and for this there is plenty of evidence, it's not just intuitive, there's that, but there's also hard evidence, uh, that, that they have cooperated in, I don't say initiated because I'm not exactly sure who's initiating what, but uh, cooperated in a campaign of fear uh, to manipulate public sentiment and to and to teach the public to trust them in ways that the public probably ought not to trust them. Uh, so um, when I see uh, that sort of thing happening and I see censorship and suppression of, of scientific and political opinion, um, I, I begin to, to have to back away from what would be the a presumed trust that one ordinarily would offer and ought to offer. Um, so it's not as simple as saying, look, hypothetically, it's possible that um, a serious pathogen is released as an act of bioterrorism and the public has no means of defending itself through democratic debate and and you know home research and <laughs> and all of that stuff so we will do it for them um of course it's true that such a situation can happen part of you know when you look at the documents leading up to our present situation documents written and and published in 2018 2019 and even going further back than that, uh, you 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 see, um, as from the the um, the uh, uh, well, I can't put it up in front of you, but <laughs> the the um, the Global uh, Monitoring Board, you 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 see from their publications before this pandemic ever got going. Oh well, we could have a situation just like this, yes. And then lo and behold, we do have it. <laughs> it's natural for people to say, "Well, wait a minute. This didn't sound just like you know we might have such a situation. So let's put some good mechanisms in place." It was that, but it also looks rather suspicious that these mechanisms were put in place precisely in order to generate new kinds of authority globally and locally which would kick into gear even with a minor pathogen like the one we're dealing with so you see evidence that the the effect of this pathogen has been pumped up by false information and by campaigns of fear and censorship going with those and Lo and behold, these prophecies from the last, the previous few years begin to come true right before our eyes. 
it's natural for people who are aware of that to say, well, wait a minute, what, you know, what's going on there? That doesn't seem quite right. Um, uh, so, you know, I point out at the end of my article that, that we are very much in danger of handing over our freedoms to the people who run the passport systems um, because we have somehow, I mean, this, this gets a little more complex in the theological and moral sphere, but we have, we have so prioritized the safety of our bodies that we've lost uh, sight of the question of the safety of our souls, and we've tended then to be willing to hand the whole business over to authorities who will do this for us. Have you ever read um, the Brothers Karamazov? Yes, I did. Yeah, so... I have not. Okay, well, well, you should. Um, <laughs> uh, one of the most famous novels of all time, and possibly the greatest novel of all time, although I don't go in for those kind of stats, but um, <laughs> or assertions. But um, but in the Brothers Karamazov, uh, Dostoevsky, um, uh, you know, towards the end of the nineteenth century, is is arguing. Uh, at one point, the, 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 the main characters are arguing in the famous chapter about the Grand Inquisitor, uh, called the Grand Inquisitor. Um, there, the, 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 the argument is that, that, that as society develops, it will get more and more dependent uh, for its health, its, its welfare, its general um, sense of, of being looked after to the point that it will sacrifice its freedoms. Um, uh, Tocqueville made exactly the same, well, I shouldn't say exactly the same, but, but made the same argument essentially um, at the end of, of uh, Democracy in America. And, and said, look, you know, where's this all going? It's a wonderful system, he admired it. But where is it, where is it going? It's going to the place where future uh, uh, tyrants will, will, um, will actually uh, um, receive their power from the people who being soft and, and soft spiritually, mentally, and physically, um, will gradually hand over their freedoms to people who will have tools for management that the old tyrants, even the, you know, the worst of the Roman emperors like Nero and so forth, never dreamed of. Now, he didn't know what you guys know. That is, he didn't know about the technology that would come in the 20th century, but he could see the process. And I think a lot of that, those visions of, of great thinkers like, like uh, Dostoevsky and, and, and Tocqueville, um, they're coming true before our eyes. And one reason they're coming true before our eyes is that, um, is that we have become soft, soft intellectually, soft morally, soft spiritually soft theologically and just soft even in terms of bodily comforts and we're so afraid to lose anything uh, of those that we're willing to lose even our constitutional liberties to a system such as now is being imposed on us um, with frankly a fairly flimsy excuse that would so, be my sense of it do you think that, that i think that's a really really interesting point do you think that um, you know, all of, all of these, um, these warnings coming from Western culture, um, where at least from what I've noticed often, often idealize the, the willingness to risk your, your life or your health for something else. Um, what is, what do you think that that's trying to teach us? Like, what, what is it preparing us for? You know, like, if we have the choice to live a, a safer life, why wouldn't we just want to take that? Well, a couple of things. One is, of course, some people choose to live that way 
they don't go on public transport at the best of times because they don't want to catch a cold, right? Um, they don't drive because they don't want to be in an accident. They don't climb Mount Everest because they don't want to run out of oxygen and fall off a cliff. Um, and one can have one's own opinions about whether this or that behavior is over the top um, in its risk taking or over the top in its risk averseness, right? Um, but, but we have in our societies and not just in our societies, you don't have to be a democracy to, to have this. Um, we, we have had a sense that, that it's okay for, for me to take more risks and you to take less risks or vice versa, whether it's financially or the, you know, what we do for sports or, you know, uh, any, any other dimension of our life. Um, and so one of the things I was saying in the article about the morality of, of, of the question of moral obligation to be vaccinated, I was not saying that there's a moral obligation not to be vaccinated, although one could make that argument in a particular case if a vaccine is derived from um, aborted fetuses. One could make that case. There are other ways one can make it, but that's the most obvious. Um, but it was an argument about whether there's a moral obligation uh, to be vaccinated. And on the level that you're asking at the moment, um, clearly I would say no, uh, and I did say no. Um, if you think that all things considered, the risks of vaccination are less than the risks of being exposed to COVID without this treatment, then you will make that decision. And we've lived in a society where it should be up to you and your doctor, right? And you might not do what your doctor says either. Like, you know, lots of times you're gonna go to your doctor, well, you know, do you want a colonoscopy? Well, who, no, not really, no, I don't. Um, <laughs> Um, but you know that if you don't get one after a certain age, you're at a higher risk of, you know, colon cancer, et cetera. Well, yeah, okay, I know that, but I'm going to die of something anyways. You know, let's get on with things here. Um, I don't want to spend my whole life in medical clinics, right? So if I take that approach, um, you say, well, you know, I think you're a fool. I think everybody should have a colonoscopy once a month, you know, um, just kidding. Um, <laughs> It, but that's the kind of society we live in. Your doctor might be a very conservative doctor in one sense and very not so in another. And you're not always going to see things eye to eye with your doctor. But between the two of you, you're going to work it out. And at the end, end of the day, the decision is yours, not his or hers, right? So when we get to the question of is there a moral obligation to be vaccinated, where it's not you, but your neighbor that comes into focus, all right, then a different set of considerations come into play. And I was treating those as well, and we might want to try to treat them further. But when we get past that to, well, look, you know, sorry, it's not actually your decision at all. Whether your neighbor's in view or yourself in view, it's not your decision. We say you must, right? And even if you think, and even if it might be true that for you, the risks of the treatment we're prescribing are greater than the risks of the pathogen, nevertheless, you're still gonna have to do it, right? Um, that's then, then a whole different set of moral questions come, comes to the fore. And, and one has to ask uh, questions about authority. By what authority do you attempt to make that imposition on the citizenry at large and each one individually? And do you really have the good of the citizen in view? Or have you some other agenda? Do you, for example, lie awake at night worrying about global warming? Do you think that global warming is essentially caused by humans? 
do you think that the only solution is to reduce the number of humans? Is this part of a program to do that? Those are not stupid questions because I can send you to the literature people who do think exactly like that and who are involved in this. I'm not saying that that's what it's all about. I'm only saying that you have to ask those kinds of questions. You ought to ask those kinds of questions. Well, I have Somebody, read about uh, were rumors about uh, global warming passports coming up. You know, well, and global you can only warming travel so many lockdown. times. Yeah, yeah, global warming lockdowns too. Uh, absolutely, yeah. See, and and by the way, for 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 global warming, there's a lot greater chance of a lockdown actually doing some good. You know, that is having a measurable effect. Yeah, that's a fair point. Then then there is. In, in in sort of violating the basic principle of quarantine that you quarantine the sick person not the healthy person <laughs> you know here if you quarantine everybody you do get reduced uh, activity and therefore probably reduced um, uh, uh, carbon emissions but that still begs the question of whether you have a right to do that um, likewise with sterilization i mean we all know that that what the Germans did in the war did not start in Germany. It started in America and Canada, where we were sterilizing people for eugenic purposes. And there are lots of people who still believe in that for a variety of reasons. And that's why some people are asking, OK, well, once you get in the passport system and your passport lapses every time you don't take the latest treatment, how the hell do you know what this treatment is actually doing to you after a while? <laughs> uh, what if its purpose is, in fact, to sterilize certain segments of the population using certain genomic sequences and so forth? Would you know? How would you know? If you, everything's been handed over to experts that you trust, but why do you trust them? Have they earned your trust? Those kinds of questions are moral questions too, and they matter. Yeah, but um, in terms of someone, uh, you know, not giving you the choice or you being risk averse versus uh, more risky. For example, if, if, if I like to drink and drive, the government would, will, will tell me, well, you can't do that because you might harm someone else, not just yourself. Yeah. So um, in that sense, I think we're OK with putting limits. Yes. On, on, on how much alcohol say I can consume. There's a quantitative number I can consume before I can I, I can drive my car. Yeah. What's what's different about that situation compared to the government telling me, well, there's a deadly, well, deadly say to certain people, uh, uh, some pathogen that's deadly to certain people, and you have to take this so that you can uh you know not cause harm to others, just like if you drink five beers and drive your car, you might cause harm to others. You, you don't necessarily cause them harm, but you might. Yeah, so um, I <clears throat> it's a good question. I think there are significant differences. Uh, again, it comes down to, it, it, I shouldn't say it comes down to, but let's start here. Um, the question of, of participation in, in these decisions about what is serious enough that we take uh, uh, consensus action and impose penalties for violators. So you and I, um, no, you know that you can't quantify this exactly because I might be able to drink five beers and drive my car just fine and you can only drink one and I, you know, we're all in trouble. Um, but, but you still, you, <laughs> sorry, is it the other way around? I'm not sure. But, but anyways, um, my point is that you can't even, you, you can't say, well, there's absolute quantification. No, you're not. You're dealing with averages. You're, you're, you're dealing with, with, um, with, right, but we, we put some limit, right? Some lower yeah, bound reasonable limits. risk uh, reduction by reasonable limits. So fine. Um, we all know, however, um, that, uh, that when someone drives drunk, um, very bad things can and do happen. And so there is a, there is a, um, there is a, a kind of built in 
natural experience consensus around that kind of law. Um, but I guess if I'm in a nursing home, I, I would say the same thing for COVID maybe. I would say there's a, there's a natural built-in consensus here that everyone should take the vaccine because if not everyone, you know, we spread it amongst ourselves and everyone would die in here in this nursing home. Yeah, so there are just a number of serious mistakes there, I, I, I want to say. Um, uh, first of all, as I was saying a moment ago, there's no such thing in our collective experience as eradicating such a virus. All right, you 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 can you can gain significant um, advantages over against various kinds of viruses if you have um, uh, effective treatments. Yes, um, and viruses do disappear naturally over time. Sometimes only a very very long time. Um, but the coronavirus is not the kind of virus that you can eradicate with lockdowns or uh, they're not and they're not claiming about these mRNA treatments that that, it, that eradicates even even it doesn't even eradicate the the capacity of the pathogen to infect you it just reduces your symptoms if you're fortunate right um so in terms of the risk reduction there, you know, they were talking 95%, but that's a relative risk reduction. The absolute risk reduction is only around 1% because it isn't a risk to most people. Um, is it a risk to old people? Yes, we agreed to that right at the outset here. Can you stop old people from being um, uh, uh, endangered by this virus? by keeping every and all, you know, every person away from them? Yes, but that's cruel and inhumane. Can you prevent them being exposed to, if not this virus, the next one, or the previous one, which had the same effect because of their weakness? As I say, when people get to be 85 or 90 and they're very frail, that's how they often die. If they don't die of some organ failure or a cancer, they die from the seasonal flu. That's the way it works. Can you hope to stop that? The simple answer is no, you can't. You can't hope to stop that. And it's unreasonable to, you know, if you say, look, we'll stop drunk driving by banning all alcohol. You could do that, actually. You could do that, and it's been tried. It's never 100% effective because there's always somebody in the woods with a still, and then there's a mob character who knows how to organize the production and get it moving again. So you can't do it absolutely, but you can do it quite effectively for a while till the mob gets the better of you, right? But we don't go there. We don't say that. We don't say, and, and the same with sex, right? If you, if you said, look, there are just a ton of sexually transmitted diseases out there. So guess what, folks? No more sex, period. Now, you could make the case that, you know, if, if you're one, one man, one woman for life, there's no danger. So go ahead with that. But for everybody else, no sex. Now, you can make a moral case that they, that they ought not to engage in that behavior, but you don't make a law saying that we will put you in jail if you do. Now that also has been tried in different societies. But, but the point is we're doing something here right now that we don't ordinarily do in two ways. We're trying to rid ourselves of a coronavirus when we've never ever before succeeded at doing that. And there's no particular reason to think that we can do it now or that there's anything much more important about this one that warrants the effort. And then secondly, we're using techniques that might make sense in trying to eradicate certain other hazards to our health. Even I'm just sticking with our physical health, not talking about our spiritual health, which I think much more important. But even, even as regards our physical health, no, you can't climb Mount Everest. I'm sorry, it's closed off because you might fall. You, you, you can't you can't ski because and you take up a hospital a leg bed. and use up a bed in a hospital. You yeah. see what I'm saying? We don't do that. So why are we doing it now? Well, we do do it in, in, the, in the sense of drunk driving. We say you can't drink five beers and drive, even if you yes. want to. Yes. And and I guess what you're what you're arguing is that the 
Actually, I'm, I'm not sure what I'm, 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 I guess I'm not, still not sure the, the, the distinction you're trying to make. In both cases, I see it as limiting freedoms. Uh, yes. But in, in one case, it's acceptable. In one case, it's not because. Well, beca because in the one case, you're saying, you're saying, you know, it's not good for you to become an alcoholic. And we don't think that the bars should stay open all night because it's not good for the neighbors with the noise and so forth. So there are rules about, you know, what time the bar has its last call. And, and a bartender does have the power to say, look, you know, I've served you as many drinks as I'm going to get out of here <laughs> um, and crawl home. Um, and the cop has the right to say, hey, you're not crawling home, you're, you're driving home, I'm arresting you, right? We, we do all those sensible things, not to prevent people from, uh, from living their lives, but to prevent them from certain kinds of serious self-harm or harm to others. So, for example, suicide used to be illegal. It was a crime to try to commit suicide. Now, if you were successful, it didn't matter uh, in the courts of this world. All right, right but right. but we have this principle. Yes, we even try to limit self harm, but we do it we do it in matters that are extreme, and we do it with prudence. We don't just say sorry, no more alcohol, no more sex, no more. Uh, 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 dangerous sports. Uh, no, you, 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 have you noticed how in the in the in the in the playgrounds and the school grounds, we've been busy taking out the kind of stuff that we used to play on as children and substituting stuff that ostensibly no one can hurt themselves on. But do you want do you want your children growing up like that? Would you like to have grown up like that? Um, there's something going on in our thinking of this, this safetyism that I referred to before, that it is, I've put it to you, a psychological disease. And I think it's been played on from the get-go by the government with these, and the media in, in lockstep with the government, um, uh, guided as we know by special op units. I'm not making that up. I mean, go read Laura Dodsworth. Um, uh, to, to persuade people to be so frightened of a drink in a bar, you know, to use the earlier analogy, but in this case, literally, I mean, the, the, the Nova Scotia chief medical officer who said, well, we, we banned you from bars, not just to keep you from passing COVID to each other, but to keep you from talking to each other. I mean, he said that. Jeez. So this kind of campaign has been going for a long time. What, what's happening to us psychologically? What's happening to us in terms of our ability to think clearly and to say, wait a minute, it's all fine and well to collectively vest efforts in protecting the vulnerable, but you don't do that by pretending to be able to completely eradicate a coronavirus. And you don't do it by locking down whole societies, and you don't do it by forcing people to take experimental treatments. So do you see a kind of uh, clash? Like, I think this is something maybe we're circling, circling around here. Is, is there some sort of clash between a pragmatism and some kind of absolutism, like e that either from let's say a libertarian who says there you know there are certain rights that no matter how bad the situation is you can't touch um or people who believe that no matter what there should never be someone harming someone else whether that's voluntary or involuntary um versus like another a, a third perspective which is maybe more pragmatic and, and maybe is that what you would say something you're trying to apply and do you see a kind of involvement of theology or the kind of things that you've looked at in the past uh, in this kind of question? Yeah, good questions. And I, um, yes, I, I do think there has to be, I mean, obviously the word pragmatism can have a, a philosophical meaning. I am not a pragmatist in that sense. Um, it can have a somewhat pejorative meaning as someone who who doesn't take moral questions into account, but just wants to find the easiest way to get the job done. I'm not saying that either. 
Um, but I do, I do support the kind of, of pragmatic thinking that says, um, you know, you don't cut off your nose to spite your face. You, 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 you treat problems um, in such a way as not to create still greater problems. So um, the harm of uh, adverse reaction to these treatments, plus the harm of the lockdowns, plus the political and psychological harm seem to me vastly out of proportion to the problem we were actually having. And by the way, in those uh, extended care facilities, there's increasing evidence emerging that many of the people who died there did not die uh, uh, from a direct reaction to COVID, but from protocols that, um, that brought on sometimes even instant death. Uh, the kind of protocols you use at the very last stages of um, palliative care or that ramped up a bit, you use in executions if you do executions. Um, so that's a whole other thing. We can't go in. We can't go into that now. Uh, and, and my, uh, you know, there are people much more competent, uh, including my wife, to talk about those things uh, than I am. But, but the the, um, the the question is always, what are we? What are we actually doing to help people? And are we helping? You you know, for example, that sometimes charities go rushing into villages here or there around the world and dropping a ton of money to, you know, to, <clears throat> to supposedly take care of this or that problem, but they're completely ignorant of, of the local ecosystem, socially as well as, as biologically. And, and they, they fly in, they drop the money, they take, they of course spend a good deal of it on themselves doing that. And then they go off and the people are no better off and maybe worse off than they were before. So it's, it's this, this idea that we might be run by people who always prevent us from harming each other. This to me is ludicrous. You, you, there, there are always knock on effects of things. Why on earth would I suppose that the people in charge are capable of preventing all harm? Uh, why would I even suppose that they intend to prevent all harm as opposed to doing some harm for their own benefit? Who's guarding the custodians? You know, who's, 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 who's guarding the guardians? Um, th this question always has to be asked. It's not easy to answer, but it always has to be asked. And I couldn't for a moment suppose as a theologian uh, or just as an ordinary human being that it would make sense to give complete trust to authorities, especially when that trust involves handing over to them the power to monitor all movements, you know, full biosurveillance. And again, you guys probably don't need, need me to point you to this, but there's plenty of government documents as well as think tank documents as well as documents in the sphere of the companies who are doing uh, the rollouts of the vaccines that, that show that they're, they're, they're absolutely intent on biosurveillance. I mean, this is not conspiracy theory. This is stuff that's right in their own documents and, and I can show them to you on government websites. So why would, why would you or, or uh, why would I simply assume that the people with those capacities are trustworthy. I, I don't see any reason to assume that. I, I know enough about human nature to, to rather doubt it. And I guess maybe, um, I think this has come up in some discussions that, and you brought up yourself with things like, uh, you know, eugenics and that, that you can, you can pretty much justify any end scientifically. Um, say in the name of safety that I can scientifically prove that it's safer to ban all driving if I want to get rid of, uh, of car accidents. Right. And I wonder uh, if, if there are some sort of theological or religious principles that are 
uh, meant to be kind of like antidotes to this to this kind of thinking. This, like, wh where do you draw in order to say, well, no, we shouldn't we shouldn't just be thinking about safety or, or you know, there's a, a higher value here. Do you know is there something that's sort of been been derived in the theology about this? Well, sure. Um, uh, you know, in fact, it's a huge it's a huge subject. Um, the the um, the the way in which we make good prudential judgments is determined by our sense of justice. If if we if we have some grasp of what is just, we can approach questions of how best to achieve justice. Those are prudential judgments. Um, so any society, um, as Leo XIII uh, reminded us at the end of the 19th century, um, any society that finds itself in trouble has to look to the the basic principles on which it built itself. Um, and he, he argued, and I would argue with him, that the most important thing a society can seek and cultivate is virtue. If it, if, if it is a virtuous society, if it's people, they won't all be virtuous and none of them will be virtuous all the time. But if you, if you cultivate uh, those basic um, virtues, the Greeks, of course, taught us the four cardinal virtues um, of temperance and fortitude and justice and prudence and the Christians taught us the three theological virtues, faith, hope, and love. If you cultivate that, that set of virtues and various others that are coordinate with them, um, you, you can hope to, to become a people and individually to become a person who, who, who not only recognizes what is just, but who becomes more or less practiced at good prudential judgments in the attempt to achieve this. But, but as Augustine pointed out, if, if you don't do justice even to your maker, why would you ever suppose that you are going to do justice to yourself or your neighbor? I mean, this is just a way of retelling you know the 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 gospel story about the the Jewish uh, um, theologians and lawyers who who asked Jesus, you know, uh, you know what or at least one of them did. What what are the two great commandments? And he said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself, because if you are learning to love your Maker, you are going to become. A, a much more whole person. And if you love your neighbors yourself, you're going to help them do that too. But the, the flip side of the coin is that, is that um, we, we should aim at that, yes, but we should not suppose that we have achieved it. Only that we ought to aim at it and to be seeking to achieve it, the utopian thinks he can achieve it. All he has to do is organize all our lives the way he thinks is best and it will all be good. That's, that's, that's the dark side, if you like. Um, it, that's the thing to be resisted whilst you're trying to cultivate in society genuine virtue. One of those virtues is humility. You don't suppose that you yourself are God, that you can eradicate all enemies of human peace, um, all enemies of justice. Uh, once you go down that path, well, you do it almost invariably the way we have seen it done in the last hundred years. You do it like it was done in the Soviet Union. You do it like it was done in Germany. You, 
do it like it was done in 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 uh, um, Latin America and in and in the Far East. You 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 eradicate whole groups of people that you think are well. These people are just never going to get it, right? Let's get rid of them. And I, I'm I, you know I, I go on a bit of a limb here and say that that the nearest and most obvious candidates at the moment are the unvaccinated. I mean, these, these are the people who are never going to get it. They're never going to understand. So, you know, let's, let, let's, let's just do away with these people. Notwithstanding yeah. the fact that, you know, that the vaccinated have to keep getting vaccinated in order to keep their passports and keep going in the system. Yeah, that's a great. I wanted to bring up the vaccine passports because we're almost two hours in and have yeah, yeah, formally got in there, good. but I'm glad you did. And uh, I guess maybe it, it brings up a principle that maybe you have to sacrifice your even health or safety for the sake of the freedom of your neighbor in, in a sense, I would imagine. I mean, this is a very silly example, but I, I thought about it. I spent uh, six months in Mexico not too long ago, and uh, there you, you can always expect... Uh, a party at 3 a.m. that your neighbors are throwing. And um, we would obviously find that upsetting, but then I realized- well, I, thought, well, I thought that was why you were there. <laughs> unfortunately not. I tend to not uh, not bother my neighbors in that way, but you know, maybe you know, my sacrificing my good sleep is one day gonna be paid back because one day my dog will be barking too loud and they won't complain. So maybe that there's this sort of idea that you know, like you said, you're not really the judge and, and you can sort of take some some of the bad from other people and, and everyone ends up benefiting, even though, you know, there are isolated instances where someone might be the aggressor and someone might be the victim. We can sort of go beyond that and try to at least harmonize a, at a higher level. I don't know if that makes sense. Well, the, the expression give and take certainly comes to mind. Um, in other words, because we are all imperfect and fallen people um, who may, even if we are seeking to become virtuous, um, you know, still hold to that vision of, of the, the Greek philosophers and the Christian philosophers, and not only they, but especially they, um, we we still because we strive to be such people we recognize that there are many imperfections in ourselves and so we have a good reason besides just trying to keep peace uh so that we can get on with our lives uh, to make room for others um now it seems to me that there's a deep irony in these proposed and enacted in many jurisdictions, uh, these, these, these vaccine passports, uh, because the logic of them on the popular level is we, we gave you the opportunity to, you know, to be the good neighbor and get vaccinated so that you're no threat to us. You didn't take it. There's a consequence for that. You're, you're excluded from, from much of our public life, right? And, and that, that makes very good sense. The, there are two difficulties with it though. First of all, it's, already become clear that getting vaccinated does not prevent you from being infected or transmitting. The second difficulty is, and then to not even press that further to the question of whether um, those who are being vaccinated who had no need to be vaccinated actually are the ones posing the danger to the rest by becoming, as it were, factories of mutant variant forms of the virus. But let's not try to settle that. Um, the other problem it has is that it seems 
to be allied with not the freedom for people who who whose prudential judgment is that these vaccines so-called are uh, and these lockdowns and so forth are are more damaging than the excuse for them that is for the path than, than than the pathogen is um but it, it, it's allied with this um with this rather draconian attempt to make everything to do with society um dependent upon the qr codes the electronic scanning um the stuff that pertains to the biosurveillance and to the necessity once you're in to stay in by continuing to take whatever you're given right if some people said look we'd like to try that we trust these guys we actually think you know we're transhumanists say we 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 think that you know that the the old carbon-based body is bad news and let's go to something silicon-based and 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 let's let's just really experiment let's climb everest right okay you know as a theologian i have problems with that because i think you're ignoring somebody here that is the person who designed you okay so if you're a transhumanist you're not too worried about that because you probably don't don't believe there is such a designer right but anyways um uh let's let's just set that aside and say fine so there there are people who want to try to climb everest in that you know that particular mountain what about people who who they may be no less um willing to take risks but that's not the mountain they want to climb they don't like that one <laughs> they want to climb a different mountain how are they supposed to have the space to live if you've organized everything so that all the production systems and all the distribution systems and all the access to things is through your qr codes you see you're no longer saying well look you know you can't come to our bar to which the response might well be you know what i actually feel safer in somebody else's bar when i'm concerned about feeling safe and I'm not worried because I'll just go look for another one because I'm fine anyhow. I, I don't worry about that. You're not just saying that to them. You're not leaving them that option. You're saying, look, buddy, you won't be able to get any medical help. You won't be able to eat. You won't be able to move around. You won't be able to cross borders. You won't even be able to charter your own aircraft, right? Or have your own fleet. You won't be able to do any of those things. It's our way or the highway. Or rather, it's our way or stay at home, <laughs> right? And starve to death. Now, we haven't got that draconian yet, but there's a clear trajectory here, right? We're not saying to people, look, we really believe in these, in the effectiveness of these vaccines. We even believe they are vaccines, though they're not. And you don't believe that, so you're not going to be able to hang around with us. So, you know, yeah, you, you create your own systems if you don't like our system. We're not leaving people that option. And, and, and my concern is that, is that the people who are organizing these things don't intend to leave that option. They, they want everybody in their system. Now, that to me is tyrannical. Uh, it's it's tyrannical because it it leaves people no options. Now those who are happy with it, I would have lots to say to them if they wanted to listen about why I don't think they should be happy with it, how I don't think it will make them happy. But if they choose it, they choose it, and it's not for me to say you can't. But it should be true the other way too. I should have options. If I don't want to go that way, I should be able to create systems that work for those of like mind. And go to people like you and say, look, okay, so maybe you work on their systems. How about work on mine too? You know. But 
as I said, I'm, I'm rather suspicious that that's not what's going on here. That I, you know, one of the reasons I think so is I watch this business about running these gene therapy experiments on children. And I say, no, no, no. Like, this is not right. This is not right. And I see, I see association between people, even in religious communities, being, being uh, denied. So that even people of like mind about these things are not allowed to meet together. I see that chief medical officer or here and see him saying, well, you know, we really didn't want you talking to one another because you might say to one another kinds of things I'm saying to you now. All right, when I see that sort of stuff, I don't think I'm living anymore in a free country. I don't think I'm living in a functioning democracy. And I ask myself, why? What went wrong that all of that begins to disappear? And I say, because elderly people <laughs> were coming down with the coronavirus and passing away, that is, if they weren't sedated to death. I had a letter, I had a letter today. Actually, no, it was yesterday, from a 92-year-old woman whose grandson uh, was coerced to take a vaccine that he did not want, take a treatment he did not want. And she was, she was very concerned and anxious about this. She was not concerned that her grandson might bring her COVID and she might die with COVID. She was concerned about the coercion of her grandson. Now that to me is, is more like caring for your neighbor and in this case, your family than some drug company experimenting with our young people and even with as they are doing now with babies drug companies that have built some of their their uh, their drug lines on the remains of babies who were killed so uh, you know when you ask me about the moral dimensions of this they're multiple and they go deep and they go all the way down and what i want to encourage people to do is not necessarily to see or gauge or judge all the facts on the ground exactly as i do but to keep wrestling with those questions because if we stop wrestling with those questions we stop being human and you know, maybe there's a kind of transhumanist that would happily have us stop being human, but there are some other types who want us to stop being human too. And I say, no, be human. Think on that level. Ask those kinds of questions. So how, how do you reconcile like the democratic uh, process with these moral avenues you've been discussing? So, you know, if everyone voted on this and said, you know, 85% of the people voted that Canada should force vaccine passports, but you know, you and I think it's immoral. Um, how do we reconcile it? Well, I have never believed, and I do not believe now, that um, that democracy is any guarantee of morality or any guarantee of political and social success. I, I come back to Talkville. I mean, <laughs> he he. Uh, he loved what he saw in many respects happening in America and deeply admired it. Um, but he knew and was prescient enough to, to see and to say um, that, that democracy too, even American democracy contained the seeds of its own destruction. It didn't, he, I, I don't think he meant that it was inevitable 
but he could see how it would very possibly happen. And it seems to be happening before our eyes. So I, I don't, just as might does not make right, neither does majority vote make right. Um, you, you, can, you can have your, your um, <laughs> you know, if you're, if you're in a lost at sea, to use the classic illustration in a lifeboat, and there are 13 of you, and, and you're all hungry, and 12 vote to kill you and eat you, um, that doesn't make it right what they're doing. So yeah, I, I, if, I guess I, I was just, you know, because we've, we've somehow gone into this assuming that we're going to, we've assumed a democracy at a base level somehow, right? So I'm just trying to reconcile now if, let's say we all voted for this as a community, we've agreed that votes in this democratic way are the way we're going to proceed. And now, you know, you and I say, well, morally, this is not right. Um, but mor morality, I guess, is, some, is subjective somehow, right? The, for them, this is the right way to proceed. Well, so... I agree with you. I, I, yeah, I, I, I agree that if, someone, if, someone, if I'm going to vote and 12 people vote to kill, to, to kill me, I, I'm not super happy about that, of course. <laughs> but, uh, but see, yeah, on their theory, you won't be unhappy long because once you're dead, you're dead and it doesn't matter, you see. And once they're dead, they're dead, and it doesn't matter, and there's no judgment, and they don't have to worry about anything. Well, I, I, I'm here to tell you, tell them and you that they're mistaken about that. But, um, but to your point, um, the 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 point of emphasizing with Leo that that any society, whether it's a constitutional monarchy or an outright monarchy, <laughs> uh, whether, whether it's a democracy or uh, 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 and whether it's a Republican democracy or some other kind of democracy is not the ultimate um, dis, um, determinant. The, de, the, the ultimate determinant of how a people fares is how virtuous they are. And if they are becoming virtuous people and want to be virtuous people and make some effort at being virtuous people, they can make any of those systems and various others work more or less well. So I don't put faith in democracy. I'm inclined to grant to the advocates of democracy that it is a system with real strengths and, and to agree with Talkville that there's much to be admired about it. Um, but I don't think it's the only possible good political system, nor do I think that it's in any way impervious to failure. So um, it, it doesn't surprise me if a country uh, uh, having ceased to be virtuous and ceased to, to be often even rational, because the two are linked. Uh, Augustine, you know, argued very cogently that, that you, you, you believe in the virtues because you believe that they lead you ultimately to happiness. If you cease to believe in happiness, you'll cease to believe in the virtues that lead you to happiness. And if you cease to believe in virtue, you'll cease to believe even in reason and you'll just make things up. I'm, I'm of course paraphrasing him uh, uh, rather crudely, but, it, but it's, it, it's really a, um, a powerful argument about that that he makes in his work on the Trinity, book 13. Um, and so um, the point is that, that if, you, um, if you seek what's really important, you will enhance your capacities to make good prudential judgments. And it, it won't matter that much what kind of a political system you live in. But, but if you let go of the virtues and you let go of a coherent worldview, it does matter what kind of system you live in, but they, because they will deteriorate at different speeds. <laughs> but nevertheless, they will all deteriorate. And you can come to the point where not only 85%, but, but, but maybe 95% uh, uh, vote for some great evil. Uh, but it's still evil. And it's not made good by the fact that 85% of the people voted for it. So 
so that's why we have to think like, you know, think out these things and put these questions and not just say, well, all the, all the authorities and all the community leaders are saying the same thing. It doesn't make them right. Now, I, you know, I've said before, I think to you, I am not a libertarian. I am not an individualist. Uh, but I do believe that liberty is, is a product of virtue and that and the people that do not seek to be virtuous will present for themselves full virtues and full acts of justice. They will be gullible. They will be easily deceived about where justice lies. And so when they're told something like, well, you know, if you don't get vaccinated, you don't love your neighbor. What kind of Christian are you? What kind of Canadian are you? <laughs> um, even though we don't think of Canadians as Christians anymore. But, it, you know, it, they will fall for simplistic reasoning about these things because they haven't actually thought in any depth about the real questions. And that's why I have to say, one of the things I admire about what you are doing is you're stepping outside of your own uh, expertise and trying to ask these kinds of questions. And I don't know how well I've answered uh, from my expertise uh, some of the questions you've posed, but, but the exercise is crucial. And once it stops and what takes its place is authoritarian um, uh, acts of coercion, I think you know, we're in serious trouble because the people mandating that stuff um, are not people whose virtues we can count on if indeed the people as a whole no longer know what really makes for virtue. They couldn't possibly know whether these people are virtuous <laughs> or even how to question whether they're virtuous and therefore to have confidence in their diktats. I think that people ought to resist, even the people who are vaccinated, right? Which is the most majority of people. They ought to give the same answer um, as the unvaccinated, when asked the question, I don't divulge personal medical information to state agents. Okay, so I, I, I'm not showing you my code. <laughs> you know, if I if I have a code that makes it easier for me to do something, well, okay, but I, I'm not I'm not going to be a slave to your coding of my life. And I'm not going to I'm not going to give up my freedoms so that you can tell me I'm now safe, especially when I can see that I'm not actually safe. <laughs> so I think there's some common ground at least can be sought there at the moment, even because virtue doesn't happen overnight. And you can't think these things out overnight, but you could all agree together to say, hey, wait a minute. No. If I go to a place and I don't feel comfortable there, I will go someplace else. But I'm not letting you tell me where I can and can't go. And if I want to love my neighbor in the most effective way I can see how, good. And if that means I sacrifice certain things for my neighbor, that's good. But you're not telling me exactly what the sacrifices are. That belongs to being human, making good prudential judgments on a sound moral basis. Let's pursue that together if we can, but we don't pursue it if we just hand it off to somebody else. This stuff can't be coded, okay? It's gotta be learned. I, uh, I think that's an extremely good place to leave. <laughs> I have more questions, but um, I think it might take another two hours. Um. <laughs> No, I, that was uh, extremely enlightening, and uh, we really appreciate your time, Professor. Hopefully, we'll have another chat soon. Well, I, I appreciate yours, and I'm I'm uh, I'm wanting to uh, to 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 learn a bit of how to use a, a, a Linux system. So I I might have oh to. Oh my god! Uh, I might have Anytime. to be calling you up for other reasons. Anytime. <laughs> I've I've just switched to a pure uh, pure Linux uh, life, and uh, it's been. Hasn't been easy, but I don't just seek uh, easy living. Yeah, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't either. Just seek the safety of Max. <laughs> yeah, I don't either, but you scare me now. <laughs> <laughs> well, just to give you a taste, I got a laptop that I had to 
do a bit of coding in order for it to charge. <laughs> It's uh, right. So you, you, uh, uh, you better send me your phone number, Carlos, because <laughs> I might need to call you. Climbing Mount Everest over here. All right. Uh, well, listen, gentlemen, thank you. No, thank I you. I appreciate thank the giving. And uh, we'll, uh, we'll hopefully we'll stay in touch. touch. Yeah. Very good. Absolutely. All right. Have, have a good evening. You, you too. Bye.